This is a presentation on how to study effectively. There are a number of things that I'm going to cover, but the first one is about keeping track of your time. I had a professor in undergrad who <clears throat> really was a strong believer in keeping a study journal. And I thought it was really silly when he first said this, but then I started doing it and I realized that it was extremely effective. It's, it's especially important to do when you have a lot of classes and not very much time. So this is an example here of a study schedule or a study log. Um, you'll see here, can you see my mouse? I'll have to point. You'll see here, this is each one of the lectures in a particular class. So this class represents physiology. This class here represents biochemistry. And then down here represents pathology, and down here would be pharmacology. Across the top, I have all of the days of the month. And then in yellow, I've highlighted the test days. <coughs> so I put in here the lecture, and then next to it, I put every single day that I study the material in the lecture and I put in this little box how many hours I spent studying it. Sometimes it's, you know, 0.1 hour, you know, not even an hour, it's just a tiny bit, I just reviewed it. But that's important because reviewing it is essential to getting the information. And this is a great way to keep track of when you've studied something last or if you've gone too long without looking at the material. For example, um, here, look, I went four days without even looking at anything in biochemistry. That's long enough to forget the material. <clears throat> I try to at least study something for, for 10 minutes, a lecture for 10 minutes, as best I can. So in here, then all of the hours for the day gets totaled at the top. So here's my total study hours up here. So this day I studied 10 hours, this day I studied 10 hours. And I don't include time if I'm on Facebook or playing a video game or watching a movie. I only count it as time if it's strictly time spent studying that lecture. And it's really quite revealing for some people when they start doing this because they find out, wow, you know, I only studied for five hours that day, but yet I was on campus all day, but I spent all my time, you know, messing around or talking to people. You have to keep a, a real accurate log. So this totals up every day. So I can see here that uh, I spent 11 hours on Monday, 11 hours on Tuesday, and all these hours then get totaled in over here for the total hours for that exam block. So, so far I'm at 144 hours studying for this exam block. And then I also total the week. So each week that I study, I keep track of how much time I put in over here in which is totaled on this side. Then over here I have it per subject. So I know that I've spent 38 hours so far studying physiology, 50 hours studying farm, and you know all the other ones are totaled up on there. And uh, this is the first and most important key to being successful in studying at medical school. <clears throat> now I want to move on to some other keys as well. Here is, here is some more information I think will be helpful. So the first thing I put down is keeping track of your hours, knowing uh, how often you study, how much you're studying, how long you've gone without reviewing the material. So the second most important thing I put on here, which actually probably should be number one, is taking care of yourself. You need to make sure that you're getting enough sleep, eating healthy, exercising regularly. If you're not doing these things, you're treating school and your studies like a sprint. And school is not a sprint. It's a marathon. You need to pace yourself. You need to make sure that you're hydrated. You need to make sure that you're not... I mean, if, if, if someone treated a marathon like a sprint, they would absolutely lose. <clears throat> you have to pace yourself, and you have to make sure that you're, you're taking care of, of the important things like getting enough sleep and emotional needs, too. So next, active study. So in this part, I, I, someone shared with this with me, or actually it was a video on YouTube that I saw, where a person said that there was two ways of studying. There was active study, and there was passive study. And at the time that I had reviewed this, I had just spent a lot of time passively studying. And as she talked about, I realized that that was a huge mistake that I made in, and it showed up on my test scores. So passive studying is things like watching a lecture, reading the textbook, those sorts of things. You're not actually pulling information out of your head. 
And if you don't pull information out of your head, then you're not increasing your skill of pulling information out of your head. Now you have to put the information in there, but if you don't practice getting it out, then you're not gonna be good at getting it out. It's that simple. The first law of psychology is any attribute you attend to increases. So if you watch lectures all the time, you're gonna get really good at watching lectures, but you're not gonna get better at answering questions. I mean, you might get some better, but it's not the primary skill that's being worked on. So some methods of active studying is anytime you are taking information that you put in your head and you pull, practice pulling it out. So if, there, if you're looking at a PowerPoint presentation, that uh, a form of active studying, or say, first of all, passive studying, a form of passive studying would just be reading what's on the slide. A, a form of active studying would be taking the information, writing down the main points, and then seeing if you can, with covering up the screen or covering up what you wrote, wrote down, recite what was on the PowerPoint, the main points that are on the PowerPoint. That would be a form of active study. Or maybe rewriting it in your own words. That would be a form of active study. Or maybe trying to see if you can make test questions out of the information on the PowerPoint. That would be another form of active study. Or maybe trying to explain what's on the PowerPoint to another person. That's another form of active study. Active studying is good. Passive studying, you need to, you need to drop it down to like maybe 20% of your time. 80% of your time should be pulling the information out of your head. <clears throat> They've done studies on this and that's the ratio they came up with that was the most successful for the highest grades or the highest success rate in retaining information short and long term. So next, rewriting the notes of the lecture. Essential. If, 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 you're, gonna, if you're going to, if the, if, the, if the teacher gives you a handout or something, just reading the handout, total passive studying, but if you can take that and, and take out the main points and reword it and shorten it down into something that's, that's just got the main concepts on there that you could, you could just see the words and it would kind of trigger the memories of what it was that you, were, what you learned, that's essential. Another really important part of active studying is getting together in groups and trying to teach certain things to the people. So what you can do ahead of time is you can organize a group and say, okay, you learn this, you learn that, you learn this, and we'll get together and practice teaching it to each other. And that's a really great way to really get down to the, the most important parts of each lecture because hopefully the students will be able to pull those things out. And also they can organize the material in ways that will help. And I'll talk about ways of organizing the material in a little bit. So um, if, you, if you don't have someone else to, to teach, I put down here at the bottom is practice explaining or teaching it, it to somebody else. But if you don't have somebody else to teach to, you still need to verbalize everybody Everybody needs to, uh, especially if you're if you're going to be a doctor, you need to be able to verbalize what you've learned. If you're not if you're not uh, able to verbalize what you've learned, then you're not going to be very effective in, in explaining things to your patients, which is really important if you want to be able to encourage them to take a medication that can save their life. And also, it's an extremely effective way to retain the information long term. So if you can't have, if you can't find somebody else to explain to, then explain to the wall. Something that I do uh, is I make a YouTube video. For some reason I have a hard time talking to the wall, but if I make a YouTube video, even if nobody watches it, I feel at least like I'm talking to somebody, maybe myself later, maybe I'll watch the lecture myself later. I do a lot of times. And then also I, on here I have doing practice problems. That's another way of pulling information out of your head. Okay, so now talking for a moment about memorization techniques. Some people wonder, well, is there some kind of secret, you know, uh, to, to being a good student? Is there, is there um, there's some kind of little trick that, that you, you do this thing and, and you know, you'll be successful? Yes and no. Uh, some other people wonder, well, well do, do you, are some people just good memorizers and other people bad memorizers? I think everybody's brain functions okay, but some people are skilled at memorizing things and other people maybe have, maybe have a hard time with it. Uh, so the first question I said, yes or no, are there tricks? There are tricks. And I think that the, the most effective studiers know these tricks and they use them and they apply them. Maybe if they don't even realize, they realize that they're using and applying them, uh, they do. But here's, here's a simple example of, of a kind of trick that you can use to memorize things. So I have to memorize all these different, uh, these different pharmacological agents, different drugs. And one of them is called dinoprostone, okay? Dinoprostone, oh boy, it's in a list of all these other ones. And uh, I, did, I did something like this for each one. There's misoprostanol, there's just tons of them. Anyway, so dinoprostone, this is just a simple example of what I did to memorize it. Well, dino kind of reminds me of a dinosaur, so I drew a dinosaur. And here I have this dinosaur, has two eggs. E stands for egg. And 
that that these these two eggs uh, have the E, you know, the E for egg reminds me of prostaglandin E. And there's two of them, so it's E2. Okay, so dinoprostone associated with prostaglandin E2. What does it do? Well, it ripens the cervix. Well, a dinosaur is going to have to have a really ripe cervix to be able to push out some eggs. So here's a way that I was able to memorize that prostaglandin E2 is associated with dinoprostone and that it ripens the cervix. See, this is just one example. It's a simple picture, but I can remember that forever, maybe. So that's the first example. That's using pictures to memorize. If you, you encode all the information, it doesn't even have to make sense, but if you, if you encode all the information onto a picture, you can remember the picture and you can go back to that picture and you can pull out the information. Oh yeah, there was a little, there was a little, uh, you know, E on the guy's ear, and that's to help remember that it's a uh, prostaglandin E2 or it's endothelium. It, just, it doesn't even have to make sense. Just in, if you encode the information in a picture, it can really help. So what's another technique? Another technique that a lot of people use to study is called mind mapping. So they'll take something and like a main subject, for example, this is decompensated heart failure. And then they'll take the main concepts associated with decompensated heart failure and they'll, they'll branch them off. So I have here decompensated heart failure, and I have atria, treatment, fluid intake greater than fluid output, and kidneys. And then under each one of these things, I have information about that. And if you organize the information like this, it's, it's a really nice way of simplifying the information in a way that is, is organized. And if the information is organized, it's easier to pull out of your memory. So this is just another tool that a lot of people use. And actually, I want to talk about another one before I move on that I have not included on here, which is organizing the information into an Excel spreadsheet. If you can take all the information and categorize it and list it all out, and then analyze it for similarities and differences, and then you group the things based on their similarities and differences, that can be a fantastic way to memorize lots of information by only memorizing a few things. Oh, this is the general rule for these five, and then make some memory thing for those five. And this is the general rule for these 10, make a general rule for those 10. And then, that, then when you're all done, you've really only memorized, you know, five or six things, but it accounts for the information of, you know, 50 things. It can, anyways. So next here is, an, is another thing that you can use sometimes. If you're really having a hard time getting something down, it just makes some stupid mnemonic device out of it. So for example, the specific causes of circulatory shock. So there was uh, septic shock, hypovolemic shock, anaphylaxic, neurogenic shock, cardiogenic shock. I got a little overwhelmed looking at all those, and so I thought, well, what if I could take the first letter of each one of these different types of shock and turn it into some, some word. So I came up with the word shank. I mean, that's, it's dumb, but it, it helped me remember the information for the test. And then under each one of these things, there was things that can cause. What causes septic shock? Peritonitis, infections of the skin, UTI or kidney, and gangrene. Well, P-I-G, pig. So septic shock, I memorized the word pig for that. I mean, it's, it's, it's a silly thing. It doesn't always work well. Hypovolemic shock, burns, aneurysm, dehydration, hemorrhage, intestinal obstruction. So I associated the word bad high with that. It doesn't always have to make sense, but it was a good first step, and I could turn around, I could recite the information from my, from my head after putting this together, and it worked for me. So there's a lot of different things that'll work for different people. Different people have different techniques, but whatever you do, make sure that you're keeping track of your hours, and make sure that you're, that you're organized, that you're taking care of yourself, and that you're doing a lot of active studying as opposed to path as opposed to passive studying. Good luck and I hope that you do well.